Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us from Latin America and, and Europe and maybe other parts of the world uh, for this webinar on participatory planning and community engagement. My name is Trisha Hackett and I'm the leader of City to City Cooperation for the International Urban and Regional Cooperation Program for Latin America, the organizer of this webinar. For those of you who may not know the program, the IURC is a European and Union funded initiative that promotes the exchange of best practice in sustainable urban development and regional inter innovation uh, in 24 cities and 20 regions in Europe and Latin America. The IURC global program includes more than 160 cities and regions from across the world. Um, before we, before I go any further, I just wanted to do a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we would love to know where you are joining us from. So please uh, write in the webinars chat box, your name, your title, if that's relevant, and where you are joining from at the bottom of the screen. Also, the webinar has simultaneous translation in, uh, in well, the webinar is going to be in English, so in Spanish and or the majority in English anyway, but in Spanish and Portuguese. So you can choose your preferred language at the bottom of the screen, interpretation button. Um, and also, uh, if you have questions or, or quest, uh, question or questions, uh, please feel free to write them in. Please do write them in the Q&A section. Um, this is a, a webinar that's focused on participatory planning and participation. So we would really like for it to be as participatory as, as possible. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this session today as this is a, is a topic and ESO is so very close to my heart. In fact, before joining the IURC, I had the good portion to work with URBACT, uh, the European, uh, largest European network on um, sustainable urban development, bringing city networks together as a participatory planning expert uh, in two different networks on social inclusion and participatory planning. Planning for urban development tends to reproduce um, kind of deeply rooted hierarchical structures of spatial production and organization. Uh, embracing participatory planning processes uh, aims to build trust among uh, public, private, and civil society sectors and among the individuals involved, uh, citizens and residents. This trust can serve as a foundation for more inclusive cities and also participatory planning is needed so that uh, Community resources can be identified, partnerships can be formed, and the duplication of services can be avoided, quality can be improved, and tax dollars can be saved. Despite these benefits, participatory planning processes are not without their challenges, often being time and money or lack thereof, but there's lots of other challenges as well. Uh, this webinar today will explore the opportunities and challenges of participatory processes and community engagement with two experts sharing their experiences and perspectives from a Latin American city, which is part of the IURC program, and an expert who has experience in many EU cities and across the world. So to understand these issues and challenges and solutions, um, we are joined by, first I will introduce Pablo Janes Mina. Pablo is a sociologist with a master's degree in inter interdisciplinary social intervention, specializing in citizen, citizen participation processes. He has worked with the urban planning department of the municipality of Puerto Montt in Chile, supporting community liaisons and social participation techniques in the development of territorial planning instruments, such as regulatory plan, heritage plan, and investment in, in mobility and public space planning. And moving over to Europe, we have Iliana Toscano. Toscano, pardon. Uh, Iliana is a urban planner and community engagement expert with experience in developing innovative projects and starting from drafting and implementing the project cycle through a inclusive approach, socially inclusive approach. She has been working in EU countries and the global south in the Balkans, promoting the involvement of relevant stakeholders in local communities aiming at supporting the processes of policymaking for urban sustainable development. It's also a lead expert with Urbac Network uh, called Playful Paradigm, which we're going to hear about, and a UI expert. In addition, she's founder, uh, she's one of the founders of Calipolis, Calipolis, a nonprofit focused on sustainable urban development and urban participation. Um, we're really delighted to have Pablo and Liliana with us today. 
So before we start the presentation, I want to remind you that we have the translation in, in Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, and please share any questions that you might have as we, we go along in the Q&A box and, and tell us who you are in the chat box. So I'm going to take a breath and give the, the virtual floor now to Pablo. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, IURC program, everyone involved for inviting me over to this uh, opportunity. Uh, for me in the south of Chile, it's such a huge uh, opportunity to participate in these types of uh, cooperation uh, meetings. So really, uh, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, so if my voice gets a little bit raspy or my English uh, a little bit choppy, I want to uh, ask uh, excuse, uh, everyone to excuse me from, from the beginning. You know, uh, for me, this is a, a huge deal. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, I'm a little bit nervous. So let's go ahead. My presentation, I'm gonna talk about what we have been doing in the land use plan of Puerto Montt. Uh, I've titled it participatory planning and community engagement, engagement and social inclusion and spatial justice tools. Uh, I want to talk about spatial justice and social inclusion because uh, even though it is uh, probably obvious and Tricia already said it a little bit uh, in her introduction, but uh, citizen participation and participati participatory planning, participatory methodologies uh, have, a I want to say a technical and political uh, background and they need to be a solution. They need to engage directly into the inequalities which have, a which have arisen in the development of the modern global economy, uh, where we have seen that inequalities in the uh, living, in living standards are completely uh, uh, widening. So people uh, enjoy the benefits of this global economy and some other people, uh, probably the majority of people, really suffer uh, everything from environmental degradation and social exclusion in its many uh, phases, uh, you know? Uh, so I just wanted to start uh, this, this, part, this presentation with uh, the urgency of participatory planning and of uh, community engagement is that we need to find solutions, concrete solutions to uh, inequality. And in this, we are completely uh, in line with the uh, two, 2030 agenda of the United Nations. And I just put this as an example of some of the uh, objectives which are directly broached by participatory planning, sustainable cities, life on land, reduce inequalities. And this is another uh, David Harvey quote about how the unequal distribution of resources in the world are concentrated in space. Space and the territory is where these inequalities present themselves. So when you, when you, when you talk about uh, changing the, in, uh, uh, the unequal distribution of resources, you need to go to the territory. And I want to... Uh, we have learned a lot about nature-based solutions uh, working in the cooperation with Pireo City. And, but uh, when we talk about participatory planning, there's another concept which uh, I have thought about. And it's not an official concept, maybe uh, as nature-based solutions, but it's community-based solutions. You know, uh, when you go to the community, when you go to people who live in a territory, you go to find what they believe are the best solutions to this, which I have already talked about, which is the unequal distribution of resources, of capital, of everything. So uh, from the beginning, when we started uh, talking about doing a thorough approach to communitary participation in the land use plan, we, we went uh, in there thinking the community must uh, be the real, um, the beginning of the solutions must come with the community. This is the Mapuche, Huilliche community of Puerto Montt. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it uh, in detail later, but it's an example of communities which need to be asked 
and not only ask, but be uh, co-creators of solutions. This is what we have done in the land use planning. I'm gonna just uh, talk about a little bit of what is the land use plan. The land use plan is a law in Chile uh, in which we um, regulate urban sprawl, activities allowed and constructability, a street network, restricted areas and protection of natural resources and heritage sites. Uh, everything, all, all, of this, uh, all of these objects can be regulated by the land use plan. So what did we do? We did all these uh, participatory meetings uh, also in 2022, this is not uh, up to date. We, all, we also did an online, um, online query about another, uh, another subject. So this also needs to include 2022. 2020, 2021 were uh, obviously and sorrowfully lost to COVID and participatory instances and meetings uh, have taken a toll and they have suffered due to the COVID. We hopefully are getting out of it. And this is what we asked. This is what we, we went to the people and we talked about all of this. We talked about how to grow, how to continue growing as a city. What activities uh, must be present or must be absent? Uh, which areas must be left restricted to urban development? Which roads must be included in the mobility network? Which roads must be widened? Because so many cars use them, they are not up to date. And what are the equilibrium of maximum heights and densities in each place of the city? And this is what we asked this year. Uh, what type of incentives or transferable, transferable rights should be included in large scale projects? You know, so, so their impact on the urban development is also transformed into uh, measures which reduce inequality, which is our main uh, interest. This is our, some photos of how we have done it. We have, uh, this is a map of a neighborhood of the city and we directly work with maps. You know, people talked about how are buildings, how are buildings built right here? Do you want to keep them in the same maximum height, which is allowed, or do you want uh, maximum heights to be downsized, you know, because so you can see, look at the ocean, or maybe just because uh, you don't like big buildings. Everything was asked to the people. This this means this means people were okay with uh, the maximum height allowed in this area. Uh, here we also asked, what type of neighborhood do you want? Do you want a mixed neighborhood, or do you want an exclusive neighborhood? The E is for exclusive. The M is for a mixed. Mixed means, uh, do you want us to, do, do you want it to be allowed to mix houses with offices, with services? Some people want to live in a very connected uh, neighborhood and some people want to live far away from everything, you know? And you have to balance uh, each type of uh, different re requirement for neighborhoods. So everything was asked and uh, how did we do it? Uh, we did it by dividing the city in all of these territories. Um, this is an analytical definition uh, which must work to achieve this bottom-up perspective. What, what does that mean? That we studied each and every year, we studied how did we do with our territories. And if we saw that not many people, from example, from this part of the city, we, we did an analysis here in, in, in uh, geographical information systems. And if we see that in this neighborhood, not many people are going to the, to the meetings, it's because we, we don't have an adequate meeting for them. So then I'm gonna go backwards. So then we needed to create a different territory of participation for them to really come. So we improved each year our territorial uh, scope by really seeing. Uh, so maybe this, as you see, there's a hill and some people from up, from upwards of the hill don't go, uh, don't, go, don't go down the hill. So maybe we need to do another meeting here, which is, this is not, uh, this is not viewable in this map, but there's a, there's a hill. So maybe we need to do meetings up here, up the hill. So we uh, uh, improved the territorial scope each year.
because if we want to do uh, a thorough uh, recognition of everyone involved in Puerto Montt, we really need to uh, do meetings which people come, you know? So um, th that's the first thing, get people to come to the meetings because uh, it's not just saying, oh, we'll, we'll afford you five meetings and if you come, you come, no. We went another time and another time and another time and we tried to make everyone come the most, the most uh, people participate. These are another photographs of how we did it. Uh, a lot of groups working uh, in their different territories. And now I'll, that was what we did with, uh, as you could say, regular uh, neighborhoods, regular neighbors. But we also have an added uh, complexity in Puerto Montt that's the presence of a lot of indigenous peoples. So uh, we also needed to afford a different methodology for indigenous peoples to participate because although they live in the city, they have different philosophies of participating. They have different philosophies for understanding the common good of, of, of the people. So, uh, we understood immediately that if we kept doing the same things we were doing for, uh, um, as you could say, uh, modern neighborhoods with the indigenous peoples, we were not going to, we, were, we weren't going to get uh, good, uh, good results. So we created a specific methodology to also engage uh, Mapuche Wijiche people. Um, how do you work with Mapuche Wijiche people? Uh, First of all, you can't do meetings inside uh, inside meeting centers because Mapuche Wijiche, Mapuche means people of the land, people of the earth. And they are so connected to their land that even though they may live in a regular neighborhood, they want to talk about other places. They want to talk about the open places, about the open spaces. So um, that's a difference. You know, when you go to regular neighborhoods, people only talk about their street, their neighborhood, but because indigenous peoples have such a connection to the land as a whole that they, they're not worried about their land, their net, their street. They're worried about the sustainability of the whole territory of Puerto Montt. And that involves, of course, as, as we saw here, water courses, green areas, hillsides, wetlands, so uh, flood prone areas. So uh, this is something that they they taught us, we didn't start the land use plan uh, saying, oh, we already know what to do. This has been a co-construction year by year of going to uh, work with indigenous peoples once, one time, two times, three times, a wetland, a hillside, uh, an open prairie, which, which some developers want to use as development and the indigenous peoples want to use because it has a sacred uh, meaning for, uh, for the territory. So we went one and one time again. And in this way, they taught us about the Kume Monyen. This is an indigenous Mapuche Wiyichi word, which means good living. The good living is a central tenet for their philosophy, for the territorial philosophy. And it, as I said before, it not only involves having the park for children to play in their, in their corner, but it also involves being in complete uh, sustainability with the territory. So what did we make? We, this is a map of Puerto Montt of the urban area. And all of these are agreements with the indigenous peoples. These are agreements to include a water course, maybe that is a small water course, but it's very important because it, it then goes into a bigger river. And so all of this, the wetlands, the protection of wetlands uh, have been something that we have reached an agreement with indigenous peoples. And as Tricia said also at the beginning, the building of trust uh, between the communities is so difficult. It's, and in Chile, it's so difficult to have trust with uh, indigenous peoples, to trust the local governments because indigenous peoples have always been left out of the equation. They have always been, um, uh, they have always suffered because of the capitalist intrusion of uh, the whole way of living in Chile. 
that they don't trust the government. So we have we have been building trust, and uh, it's in, it's very important for us to reach agreements, technical these are technical agreements of real pragmatic stuff that we can include in the land use plan. This is not these are not you know like uh, philosophical ideas. These are concrete ideas that we will protect this hillside from uh, development. We will protect this wetland from development uh, because of their importance for environmental sustainability. So this has been very big. Um, it's probably one of the best examples of uh, co-building with indigenous peoples in Chile because it's very difficult. Maybe not everyone knows, but uh, there's there's a huge uh, conflict with indigenous with Mapuche peoples in Chile. In some regions of Chile, there's even some low low uh, intensity civil war going on so it is violent there's violence there's assassinations so uh, we have managed to avoid all of that uh, but by being very trustful with them you know we we if we say we're going to be one day we're going to do something we do it that's very important for particular plan and all of all of which I have mentioned before, both in uh, regular modern neighborhoods and uh, considering the indigenous worldview has been systematized in reports uh, which we have uh, returned to every community because they, they deserve to know uh, what has become of what they told us. You know, uh, we, we, we did four or five years of meetings uh, intense meetings in which we talked about absolutely everything which pertains their territory and we needed to uh, show them what, what, what it meant so we did this is an example of some report uh, some of the pages of the report uh, we we did an education continual education so we went again and told them this is what uh, this means this means that we will leave this territory more exclusive because it, it's in a promontory which probably uh, deserves to be left alone and in this part which is a lower ground uh, we will have another color this means it will be a mixed neighborhood those type of things you know a continual education and in, in what uh, and, and co-creation of everything in the land use plan this is another example of how we did it uh, all of this is so uh, we also uh, we tried to be very professional in the methodologies and in the system. Systematization is very difficult in participatory processes, you know, because you, you do a meeting and getting people to go to meetings is so difficult. And doing the meetings, doing 30, 50 meetings with the people, and then uh, to have the energy to have uh, the systematization of hours and hours and pages and pages. It's also a, a tough job, you know. So, uh, and it's and, and it's something that probably it's, it's the most important thing to uh, learn about what Ileana will show us and uh, about other cities and how they do it. Because in systematization, I believe is uh, probably the uh, how you can put it, the, the the gold of participation. How you transform everything that has been told to you by a lot of communities with different perspectives and meld it into something useful, something just, something fair, something which really contributes to the better uh, lifestyle and to the uh, um, to lowering the inequality of a territory. These are examples of some things which will be included in the land use plan, uh, which uh, are directly a result of participatory planning. All of this is directly a result of participatory planning. This is the map of Puerto Montt. We improved the adequacy of road networks. We created roads because some people said, we can get from this part of the city to this part, you know, so it's ridiculous. We have to go this way to arrive here. We need to go this way and return. So we need to include some roads here. Uh, some places didn't have any equipment, uh, any services. We also uh, are planning to create service areas for different territories. Uh, we have an island here, a small island, 
and there was a plan to connect it by bridge, but people in the island, they uh, through a, a participatory process, they decided that they don't want to be connected by a bridge. They like to be connected by sea. So we're gonna leave it like that because a bridge really only opens up space for developers and doesn't take into account the, the lifestyle of the people in the island. So we're gonna leave it like that and it's et, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, prohibition of industrial land use. Some, some neighborhoods were mixed industrial, residential. We're gonna take out all the industrial uh, land use from heavily de he uh, density heavy neighborhoods because uh, obvious reasons. All of this uh, has been thanks uh, to the people which have participated in the thousands in all of the meetings which we have done. And just to uh, don't get, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to get boring <laughs> talking too much. I, I get a little bit passionate about this subject because it has been a uh, a long process. We, we're about to see the the light at the end of the tunnel. We are about to uh, consolidate all of this in a really forward-looking uh, land use plan. And this is some of the main challenges that we have uh, found. You know. Uh, wetlands, 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 wetlands. Uh, water and wetlands are the key to our uh, continual existence on Earth. And uh, this has been, every year it's more evident. You know, when we started in 2017, uh, it was all global warming. But five years later, global warming is absolutely the main subject in every single urbanism discussion uh, you will have. So it has been uh, every year, uh, it's more important. And uh, we have confirmed that we need to improve our technical adequacy in the management of wetland areas, of peri-urban areas, which are mostly where wetlands and open spaces are connected. We need indigenous peoples, academic sector, the private sector, and, and the public services, of course, to get together and try to find uh, solutions together. This is very difficult in Chile, very difficult in Chile, but we are trying to have a stakeholder tables. We have also learned this from the Pireus collaboration. They have given us some pointers on this. So it's very important. And why, in the, why is this difficult? And why is this important? Because of this, the, the NIMBY, the not in my backyard uh, phenomenon. This in Chile is a huge phenomenon. Uh, it's so difficult for people to think of the common good uh, that uh, we really need to have, uh, we need to be more creative. We need to be have more flexibility. We need to be less academicist and less technical and really get to find ways in which people can uh, work together and, and find community-based solutions for them to work together. And uh, of course, uh, and this is a, a sad reality, but the, the, uh, there's a huge crisis worldwide and uh, participatory planning will get even more important and even more difficult uh, moving on. You know, It will be more crucial and it will get more difficult when people are fighting for scarcity of resources. So we need to find a way for people to work together to understand that scarcity of resources will only be uh, fixed by working together. And this means a constant and meaningful process of education and in all phases of public policies. So that's the, oh, sorry. That's the end of my presentation anyway. Uh, thank you a lot. Wow, uh, Pablo, if we were in a, a conference room, I think we would all be clapping at your um, passionate clarion call to the importance of participatory planning. So thank you for that great presentation and um, I think you know I really want to congratulate not only you and, and your colleagues but you know those in the leadership of Puerto Montt um, for it, it's clear that that your city has given uh, social inclusion community engagement participatory planning um, that is important to your city and that you are you know that you have developed quite sophisticated uh, mechanisms for engaging uh, local communities, but not only that, I mean, you know, something that you said really struck me that, you know, this community didn't want to have a bridge, and so they're not going to have a bridge. I mean, 
that's that's actually quite a big deal because I think a lot of cities would say we're putting in a bridge whether you like it or not because it's important for economic development and I'm sure there's you know there's a whole story behind that um, but that that really that really struck me um, so that's a, precisely why we invited you to be a part of this you know having heard your your presentation before about Puerto Montt and um, you know the activities there and and you have um, in your city and region the um, the added complexity of having in indigenous uh, communities, um, you know, and the, the sensitivity that uh, the city is engaging with those communities um, is also, you know, something that we really wanted to highlight because um, it's it's very important and it's not, you know, in, in the case of Puerto Mano, it, it's indigenous communities, but I think in every city there are um, what we'd say vulnerable communities or communities with fewer resources. So, um, you know, that's something that I think would resonate for for um, a lot of people in our in our audience. So um, thank you for that. It was it was a wonderful presentation. And I'm going to, to stop now. So um, and hand over the floor to Eliana Toscano, um, who I, I want to say is, you know, we're delighted to have her here with her international experience and particularly European experience. And also it's really important for us. This is the first time um, that I know of any way that we've had, and uh, I know you're more than just an Urbact expert, but I want to highlight the, the Urbact experience that you have, Eliana, um, because Urbact was um, really the inspiration for the IURC program. Um, Urbact's been around for, I think, over 15 years. It's, um, I mean, I, I'm biased because I come from working with Urbact and I'm a big fan. Um, uh, it, it's been in a very important inspiration for the IURC program. So we've you know, this is um, a commitment to take kind of the ethos and uh, methodology of the of the Urbac program and and take it to a global scale. So, it's particularly um, uh, special for us to have you here, Eliana. So, over to you. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tricia, and thank you all for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I will try to share my screen. As, a, as I said, I'm really delighted to, to be here today with you for presenting some of my experiences uh, in working on urban participation for inclusive cities. Before starting to focus on the Urbact and the Urban Innovative Actions Project, I just would like to, to share with you a short story of my background because after my graduation in architecture and urban planning, I have had the opportunity to work in Latin America, in Ecuador, in Quito, for a research project uh, focused on the informal settlements of Quito. And then I uh, get other opportunities to work uh, mainly in the Balkans, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and but also in Algeria, in the refugee camps for the Sahrawi population. In uh, 2006, uh, together with some friends and colleagues, uh, we co-funded Callipolis, a not-for-profit organization dealing with sustainable urban development and urban participation based in Trieste in Italy. And thanks to this organization, we achieved to promote several projects of sustainable urban development for several countries. Uh, just uh, as an example, we work in uh, Albania, Argentina, Croatia, Cuba, Ecuador, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lebanon, France, Jordan, Slovenia, Vietnam, and, as well in Italy and in several other uh, European Union countries. But what uh, do all of these experiences have in common? If I have to answer to, to that, uh, I, I can say that uh, uh, the ideal was in common, the approach we try to promote and to use, and the approach to work with the people, for the people, to co-design and to rethinking on urban spaces and on city planning. So our idea was to promote from the early beginning of our organization and in our profession, the community planning approach in all of these countries, in all of these experiences, to co-design with residents, with the inhabitants, uh, best and just neighborhoods to live and urban spaces for, for living, for staying, for meeting people, etc. 
But today I wish to uh, follow up on two uh, particular projects I have been honored to, to follow uh, for the Urbact program uh, you mentioned, Trisha, and for the Urban Innovative Actions uh, program. This, this project are called the Playful Paradigm and we started to work on it from 2018. And we are in the last step of our journey because the project is ending in the end of this month. And the second project is called Camina, is based in Spain and it started on 2020 and it, it will go on until 2024. But before I wish to follow up on, on Playful Paradigm Transfer Network. The Playful Paradigm Transfer Network is focused on play as an innovative tool to rethink city. But in which way? First of all, the Playful Paradigm is a transfer network and we had the opportunity to work with the two ways of cities. And in total, we engage uh, 12 cities across Europe to transfer the philosophy of play from the lead partner city, Udine, in Italy, to other cities in several countries, as you can see in this map. But uh, uh, what all of these uh, cities uh, trying to achieve was to transfer the philosophy of play and the approach of promoting playful activities to foster social mediation, healthy lifestyles, sustainability, place making, economic prosperity, and so on. And the question, why play is so important to trigger participation and transform urban public spaces, which are the connections between urban participation and play? For answering, I wish to start with the experience of the lead partner city, Udine, because uh, they uh, started uh, many years ago, almost more than 20 years ago, in promoting play. They decided to launch playful activities for engaging local communities in marginalized areas of their cities. And they decided to invest on play. They decided to invest on mobile toy libraries for bringing play in the suburbs, in the uh, in the neighborhoods not so close to the city center but what is the ludobus what is a mobile toy library it's really simple it's a van full full of uh, games full of toys of play urban games uh, with a facilitator that allow children families adults and all the people to play in every urban space and they discovered that Ludobus was a really powerful tool for inclusion because uh, while playing, there are no barriers of culture, there are no barriers of languages, there are no barrier, barriers of gender or age. But uh, um, more than, than other things, the Ludobus and this type of activities uh, brings an important message. This important message is that every place in the city is a place for playing. Is a place for playing, sorry. And this is really important. It's important for the local community, but also it's important for the local politicians that every place of the city is a place, is a place for playing. And this is, a, this is an example of uh, uh, what a Ludobus could do <laughs> in a square. For instance, we are in Udine, we are in Italy. Uh, in the first image in the, in, the, in the left in your screen, you could see the Ludobus just close and then starting to, to create a space while keeping a square. And immediately the Ludobus is a catalyst. People start to come and to play without being addressed uh, of, for playing and be, um, without being addressed to uh, how to do, how to play, how to uh, be involved in this space. 
So also without announcement, the ludobus work very well. The playful paradigm partners were so inspired by Udine, by playful paradigm experience that they started to experiment play outside playgrounds and the promoting play as a transformative tool for different urban public spaces. Here we are in Ireland, in Cork, and they decided to uh, transform the areas in front of the schools in areas uh, able, open for play. They closed the street to cars, simple, and they opened the street for play. And the children, families, adults start to enjoy also the moment to bring <laughs> children at school, not to just leaving them by car and go and go home or go work, but staying with the, with the children and enjoying also the moment of bringing children at school. Here we are in two different situations. We are in Elgava in Latvia and in Udine in Italy again. In the same day, uh, they organize a playful placemaking experience for the World Game Day held on uh, 28th of May this year. They used the play to transform central urban areas in place for playing, reorganizing those places and also experimenting play in places where generally people just uh, just go through. Here we are in Spain, in Igualada, and they use the play to experiment again the powerful potential of playful plays making to transform temporary the city. Indeed, the play is a really uh, is a, has a huge potential for city transformation. And again, they decided to close the street to cars and to open the street to play and to see how the people get involved, how the people be engaged in those, uh, in those games. Here we are in Rosuplie, and in Rosuplie, play was used for promoting education and intergenerational approach and the learning for children and adults because play is for everyone and play could connect also generations so different as the oldest and the youngest. In this second wave of playful paradigm, we achieved to concentrate the attention on four dimension of play and we focus on play for urban regeneration play for inclusion and the participation, play for education and play for health and well-being. But what I would like to share with you is that we tried also to improve the playful paradigm experience of our cities, focusing the attention on two particularly um, important element of play, the gender sensitive approach for designing recreational spaces for play and playgrounds, and the innovation uh, approach for toy libraries, which could be transformed in living, living labs. First of all, I wish to share with you uh, this concept of transforming toy libraries in living labs. The toy, libraries, the toy libraries are, for definition, already hands on public spaces, addressing uh, uh, participation, equality, and, and intergenerational learning. But they can be more. They can become places for democracy because you can promote community planning activities inside the toy libraries, also for promoting equality by welcoming women and girls to play, but especially to participate at co-decision making processes because they could come with their kids if they are mothers and why they are participating to the uh, particip participatory planning workshop, their kids could play in a, in a safe space. 
the toy library living labs uh, promote creativity because it's possible to make uh, crafted toys through cheap and cheerful materials like chalks or natural objects, also organizing workshops inside the toy libraries. They could promote the cooperation with the world territory, connecting a local association, NGOs, and other reality, other actors in the city. And last but not least, they also promote accessibility because they could promote the concept of design for all and allowing playing for all, taking uh, special consideration for people with special needs. And the, the, the other important topic for us is, as I said, to promote the gender sensitive approach for designing well and good urban spaces for play and playgrounds because evidence has shown that there is a disproportion in the use of playgrounds and schoolyards. Generally, uh, the 70% uh, of those playgrounds are dedicated to sports activity. The third, just the 30% are for other activities. Generally, the football pitch is often positioned in the central space, often sometimes just few athletic boys, while girls and unsporty boys are pushed to the fringe of the space. So we need to rethink the idea to design our uh, spaces for playing, our playgrounds and our schoolyards, because through an equal design, we can provide an important contribution to the construct the gender stereotypes and the inequality starting from the early age. But how we can do that? For instance, we can um, reduce the space for the football pitch and we can, we can create more worlds where people could play and could interact also between girls and boys, for instance. But for giving you an idea, about uh, how we can do this, uh, uh, this uh, novel uh, design for uh, playgrounds uh, and for schoolyards, I wish to share with you this motion graphics. In cities, especially in suburbs, children do not have adequate spaces for playing. Cars are the main obstacles and urban public spaces don't welcome play. Play and children are relegated to playgrounds, which many times are sad and made by concrete. Child's play and the immense learning potential it brings is the greatest victim. Play poverty is on the rise as is the number of children living low play lives. Play is essential for children's health, physical and emotional growth, and intellectual and educational development. Girls and boys through play learn about democracy, respect and solidarity. Spaces for playing that reflects those values have a huge importance in education. Evidence has shown there is disproportion in the use of playgrounds and schoolyards. Football pitch is often positioned in the center space, hosting few athletic boys, while girls and unsporty boys are pushed to the fringe. The redesign of play places, such as schoolyards and playgrounds, through a gender-sensitive approach, can provide an important contribution to deconstruct gender stereotypes and the inequality starting from early age. Co-design processes trigger the engagement with children and their families to analyze their daily habits, their needs, and propose improvements that benefit the entire community. The redesign should prioritize gender-neutral colors and multiple play worlds to promote interaction between girls and boys and versatile space uses. It should foster creativity and engage with nature, as well as sports and active games. In this way, 
children can play without stereotypes. The future of the public spaces passes through schoolyards and playgrounds of today. Yes, and uh, in, in this play is a, is a really serious matter, and this is our motto because, uh, yeah, uh, we can really make the difference uh, for, sorry, <laughs> for a better urban future of cities. I will again start to share my screen for sharing the second part, uh, really short, of my presentation. I hope you can see it. Yeah, okay, great. Yes, this is the motto of Playful Paradigm, as I said. And we try to experiment uh, uh, all of these innovations and all of this play potential in several cities of the network. Now I will go in, uh, uh, in Spain, I will go in Almeria for presenting you this uh, uh, second project, so-called Camina. This is funded by the uh, Urban Innovative Actions uh, Program, now called the European Urban Initiatives. And uh, um, the goal of the project is to, uh, to rediscover the value of culture and cultural heritage to integrate social, for the social integration of three deprived neighborhoods that also represent the splendor past of this city. So here you can see a picture of the ancient Almeria, the ancient Almeria, we are in Andalusia, and you can see that these three neighborhoods that now are deprived and neglected were the core, the art of the vibrant city during the past. So they, they were in the art, but now the citizens decided to go outside of this neighborhood and to live in the suburbs. So Camina, the Camina project decided to focus on three neighborhoods, three barrios, uh, so-called La Chanca Pescaderia, the center and Almedina to work on uh, three landscape, uh, cultural landscape. So we have the, the Muslim al Kazava, we have the old port of the city, and we have an old culture, particularly culture for this area, so-called Indaliana culture. We have uh, several buildings, historical buildings, cultural heritage for the city, completely, uh, almost some of them completely destroyed. And we want to create one single vote to try to connect all of this, to invite the people to come here and to again enjoy the cultural heritage present for, uh, for the city of Almeria in these three neighborhoods. But how to do that, how to achieve this goal? The city of Almeria, together with the delivery partner, decided to write a novel city narrative through a participatory approach, because they need to rethink together in their uh, common past, in the common goods they have. And for doing that, they build a, a matrix, they build a cultural ecosystem of all the stakeholders and uh, uh, the citizens and the people involved to co-create this novel city narrative. And for doing that, they used this slow approach for participation. Indeed, the project acronymy Camina means walk. And they decided to walk across these neighborhoods for meeting the people, for meeting the inhabitants of the neighborhoods, and for collecting information, 
for keeping in touch and for build the trust between the local communities and the project partners. To write these novel collective narratives means to connect feelings, needs, people, neighborhoods, city imagination, and especially to connect to the future, to the past, and to the present of the city of Almeria to build a common cultural landscape. And here I feel me really close um, what about Pablo said before, because again, the, the trust the idea to collect, the idea to stay with the people and to use their code of languages to build this, this narrative. For doing that, the methodology used for, uh, for building, for writing the narrative was so-called the, uh, the story bank, inspired by the idea of the Noah's Ark, where all the stories are important. The story of life, as well the cultural stories, have the equal importance for building uh, this uh, common culture, uh, cultural landscape. And uh, this, uh, um, this narrative uh, allows the municipality of Almeria and the project partners to launch the idea of the civic curators. The civic curators are, the, uh, are working groups to co-design these novel cultural programs to involve the people in participating from the early beginning, from the design of the cultural program, not just as uh, mere uh, spectators, but uh, as uh, artists as well themselves. So they launch this call for proposal for local organization, but also for citizens and for uh, people living in this neighborhood to participate in writing these cultural programs to be developed in these three cultural uh, nodes present in these three neighborhoods. So the, culture, the civic curators in the next year will write, but also will implement some cultural activities inspired by the present, the past and the future of Almeria in the three neighborhoods in these cultural notes, but also in the streets of Almeria, with the idea also to regenerate the, the three cultural notes. And here you can see uh, the pictures of these buildings, but also to create an idea of uh, an uh, open air city museum for Almeria, where the people feel free to come, to visit and to participate to cultural local activities from the early beginning, from the designing of these activities. Thank you very much. You're muted, Tricia. Thought I had unmuted, uh, rookie. Problem. Uh, it, I was just saying, Eliana, that um, if we were in a big conference room, we would be hearing lots of applause. So um, thank you for that um, wonderful presentation of those, both of those projects. And I think for, for me, what what comes, what is very present is that um, you know that planning processes and remaking a city doesn't have to be boring. I think a lot of people associate planning with very boring kind of administrative, um, you know, you get called to city hall and sit in a room for consultation. And I think what both of those projects show is that um, there can be other ways of uh, transforming cities um, using play, using culture, using creativity. Um, and so both of those are, are fantastic and inspirational examples of and it's great to see the photos and see it kind of in, in being able to, to see the, the intergenerational, for example, play that you showed. And um, it's just just fantastic. And I, I know that it's something that it's, you know, their um, methodology, the more than the, mes well, the methodologies, of course, but also the, the kind of the ideology, the, the um, Kind of change, changing or um, challenging this notion that uh, you know urban development and planning has to be something 
boring um, in some room in City Hall. Um, and, and you know, that's something that your, your, your project as well as the work that Pablo and his colleagues are doing in Puerto Montt uh, very much have in common. And I think the other, the other underlying thread there is, is around trust. And I think, you know, the, how Puerto Montt is working with citizens and those kinds of um, uh, projects that you're working on, Liliana, building trust um, is, I think it seems to be absolutely a foundation um, for uh, being able to engage um, communities uh, and ultimately leading to, to transformation. And, I, I can't believe it. We've we've run to the end of. <laughs> I thought we would have uh, more time, um, but before we go, I know we have at least uh, one question from Arali, part of the team. I don't want to go without having to just stay, stay for a few more minutes. Um, uh, Arali, I'll give you the floor so you can ask a question. Thank you again, Ilian. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you again also for your great presentation. It was really, really interesting, really amazing. I just had a really small question because you mentioned so many great initiatives, so many different methodologies in different places. Uh, and I wonder from your experience of working in different contexts and with different groups of people, how do you do you get a certain feedback on how to improve the participatory processes and the methodologies and how was it integrated in your work? Because I'm, I guess that you also did some things that didn't work so well, because I guess you presented the most beautiful side of, of the picture and how did you integrate the lessons learned from um, these kind of, not failures, but uh, lessons I would say in, in some of the projects you explain or, or you, your practice or urban, urban planning in general? I guess the question is for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yes, um, it's a really nice, but also difficult question to answer. Uh, I, from my experience in, uh, in different countries and cities with different communities, if you well plan from the beginning, the community planning process, uh, you uh, try to avoid some, uh, you know, in part that uh, you cannot control. Generally, you always can expect good results, but of course, some methodology are not, uh, are, are not so tailored for some particular groups. So yes, sometimes I like to change my the methodology I, I wish to use or that uh, I try to, to use with my group. And every time we try, sometimes we fail, yes. But more about the methodology, not about the results, because uh, uh, in my experience, uh, all the participatory processes I have the fortune to work for, they always uh, get uh, important results for the community because of course, they are processes uh, useful for the local authorities to put in practice uh, some of these ideas shared by the citizens. But first of all, is a process where citizens can learn each other and it is always time good to use <laughs> for everyone, for uh, myself as well. I always learn and I always improve. What I can say, what I can say, I try to uh, bring with me all of my experiences and to be creative when planning uh, uh, novel participatory processes. In the case studies I presented, I was not in the first line as a facilitator because uh, I had the, law, the role of advisor for supporting cities, for supporting local facilitators. So it's a different position. But in many times I work uh, my, <laughs> on my, um, as, a, as, a, a, as a local facilitator as well in involving directly uh, the local communities, which is sometimes uh, a bit challenging. But yeah, again, I think uh, be creative, be collaborative, involving uh, 
local communities collaborate also in designing the participatory process with local communities could help in achieving, in achieving good results as much as possible. I don't know if Pablo agree with me with this uh, feedback. Uh, totally agree with you. And um, it's very complex to, as I, as I said, to gain trust is so difficult that uh, sometimes uh, you don't even uh, have the energy to systematize the results and, and, and get, get, into, uh, get into the part where you can uh, improve your methodologies. But, but you need to do it and you need, you need to always be, um, that, that's the interesting part of uh, putting the universal methodology or the universal idea uh, in touch with the local uh, reality because one without the other uh, kind of uh, kind of gets lost in space you know because only getting to uh, only worrying about the local implementation and the local problems and that this neighbor has that difficulty with that neighbor and uh, the inequalities present in Chilean cities are so big that it's, it's, it's difficult to work, uh, but you need to have a universal idea uh, of values uh, with, with, for example, the idea of play as the, the playground of participation is the, the schools, the play, the, the play situations for children. What they will learn there is what the way they will live when they grow up. I see it with my son. I have a five-year-old son. So I, I, I totally understand uh, the importance of playing uh, as a conceptual tool. Um, I only had a, a, a small question for Ileana. Uh, maybe we can continue talking another time. But how do you, how do you transform this, uh, this participation with children? Uh, I saw you had a map, like a, a, a different, like a maze, you know, like a, a labyrinth. Um, but how do you transform it into uh, into knowledge? What type of systematization techniques do you use, and how, how do you turn it into uh, ideas? Uh, I don't know if you have time to answer it now, but uh, that that's the most important thing. As you say, just just the uh, just the opportunity to participate is good for a community, but it can it would always be a good deal to have participation, but it can be even better. If uh, systematization techniques are improved each time we, we go uh, to the field. So that, that's always what I am most interested in when I, I go to these uh, seminars, webinars, uh, trying to get to know like uh, techniques and uh, specific methodologies. I don't know if we have time to talk about it now, but uh, thank you, Eliana. Thank you, everyone uh, here for the opportunity to get this knowledge transfer. Eliana, did you want to respond to that or is it too big? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I can just uh, share some okay. insights if you want. Yeah, I, I was really surprised about this thing about systematization. I agree that sometimes it's not easy to collect everything uh, in something friendly, useful, uh, also for the participants uh, when you launch a participatory process. In the case of Playful Paradigm, in the case of prom promoting play, play is uh, something that can trigger the participation of citizens and can trigger the participation of also young people that generally are excluded from the decision-making processes. So to uh, to launch playful activities could uh, could be useful for uh, getting in touch with these kind of stakeholders that generally are not so easy to involve for systematization um, with a playful paradigm we do not use a particular tool for systematizing the uh, the work but we wrote several roadmaps of our successful or of our experiences because uh, it was more uh, linked to the placemaking activity in the sense to experiment in urban public spaces the changing that you could 
uh, could provide through play, but not just to play. So to, um, to make a recording of those experiences by also inviting local stakeholders in writing some diaries. So we do like that, especially in the fourth wave of the network. And we try to, to record all the journey of this experience, in particular because the experience of Playful Paradise, it was focused on the tra transferability dimension of the project from the lead partner to the other partner. So in the end, all the cities have their own uh, let's say, a roadmap, a local action plan, and also report, final report, where they wrote uh, what worked well and what not. In other activities, yes, we, I can share other, other insights. For instance, the, the play, the playful activities could be also used as a methodology for co-designing. For instance, I think that you already know the block by block methodology, which use uh, Minecraft, which is a video game for involving youth in the co-designing and we use as well for co-designing co uh, an urban area. So you could use play in a really versatile, versatile way. And I was uh, on my own surprise how it works well. So I, because I also experimented in my own life with my children as well and with my neighborhood to try to put in practice something of the lesson learned during Playful Paradigm. So I really suggest you to to try also in your uh, in your neighborhood to close the street for one day and to transform the use of the space. Thank you, Eliana. That was a great succinct. And, I th and I'm, I'm glad that you touched on, because that was one of the questions I had um, and we didn't have time for it, but you touched on the, this idea about transferability, because obviously that's, a, that's the, the essence of, of Urbact and also with IURC in a more bilateral way, but you know, adapting um, successful uh, or the successful parts of, of, of projects and methodologies um, and contextualizing them in different different cities, different cultural as different countries, different cultural um, contexts, which is which is so important and and you know it's it's, it's a challenge, a very interesting challenge, um, and. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for touching. I think there's a whole other webinar. I've, I've thought about that, yeah. about the, you know, the challenges uh, and opportunities around the transfer of tra practice between between cities and um, a, an interesting one. And um, there was one other thing I wanted to say and uh, it left. Um, so I think that means it's, it's time to, to stop with this. It's so rich. I know that we could we could go on and on, um, but it's it's also what I what I love is um, that hearing about what you know from a Chilean city and also from the European context, you know the, the challenges and, and opportunities that are are really quite um, global, or at least between let's say the the Americas in in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you've you've offered a lot of interesting tools and in, insights uh, for our audience and. Um, so I think we'll we'll stop. Go ahead, Eliana. Yeah. No, I just wanted to to share something which is not completely uh, directly relevant with Urbac or with uh, Urban Innovative Actions uh, as a programs, but uh, I wish to to share something about transferability. I think mm -hmm. that in Europe we transferred some participatory methodology taken from Latin America. And this is a very important. This is very important for for us. And I could experiment experiment in my own life uh, that because I started in the international cooperation in working on participatory planning, and it was uh, in the global south. And it was yeah. why uh, the urban planning sometimes uh, cannot uh, uh, reach the adequate time of the growing of the cities, of course. So the community mm -hmm. planning helps this type of growing. But now we are in, in Europe, we really need to promote participation because yeah. uh, uh, so um, less people going to participate in the democratic life here mm -hmm. in Europe. So we need to approach other uh, methodology 
to be uh, to to stay close to our citizens and the municipalities and the participatory planning helping the co-design activity but also happy helping local authorities in taking better decision and we learn from latin america <laughs> these methodologies so thank you very much because the, trans well, thank the transferability no, thank you for that bilateral yeah <laughs> No, it's absolutely bilateral and that. Uh, thank you so much for mentioning that. And that also helped me to remember what I was going to say, which is, I, I think that's something that it's, it's both embedded in your, your project methodologies and in Put de Mont, that it's important to go where people are. You know, it, I mean, traditionally, there's this concept of consultation where we, you know, that you get a flyer maybe in the mail or an email now saying, we're going to have a meeting in City Hall at four o'clock. Please come if you're interested. And, you know, maybe people are working and they are interested, but they can't, you know, they don't have the money to pay for a bus to go to see, you know, the fact that you, you're you in, in both Puerto Montt and in your project, you go to where uh, people live and where they are, I think is absolutely probably one of the most, well, the most important foundation anyway for successful participation is go to where people are and then, you know, make it fun and interesting as possible as well. It's certainly been been my experience. And I think those are, you know, those are kind of key takeaways, if you will, from these these processes is go to where people are and make it fun and interesting. And then the other thing is, uh, Pablo, you talked about, you know, the, the system, systematization and that there's value in just bringing people together, which is true to a certain point, because if people feel like they keep coming together and nothing changes, then they get frustrated. So it's also that kind of feedback loop that make people understand that their inputs, maybe, maybe they, you know, the city won't be able to respond exactly as they want, but at least that they've been they've been heard. Um, and I think that's another important key in this participatory process. That uh, feedback, um, people feel like their participation and their time uh, is meaningfully. Uh, has been meaningful, not only connecting with their neighbors, which of course has its own uh, value independent, but also kind of in, the, in, in terms of transformation that, um, that they've been listened to and, you know, they've been told, you know, this, this is what's happened with, the, with your feedback and with your, you know, your, your ideas. We might not be able to do it now, but maybe we can do it in the future. Oh, we could go on and on, and we're we're really over time. So I'm going to going to stop here. But thank you so much, Eliana and Paulo, for these great presentations. Really, a lot of food for thought there, and we have um, a whole season of of webinars coming up in the next year. So I think you know we'll be able to continually kind of get more specific and get down to more detail. So I can I can think of a couple of different webinars that we could focus on with this participation. But you've given us great inspiration and food for thought. Uh, for those of you who are still with us, we invite you to follow IURC in social media and on the website if you don't uh, already. Later, we'll send you out a link to today's presentations and, and recording. Um, there'll also be a, a short two minute survey uh, at the end of this session. So um, thank you all for joining us. And um, thank you again, Ileana and Paulo for these wonderful presentations. And wishing everybody a good rest of your day or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. So thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Bye Thank bye. you, Juliana. Thank you, everyone. Really. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love. Thank you, Pablo. Bye bye. Really, lo really loved it.